Welcome to another episode of the People Over Perks podcast by Leapsum. In each episode, we speak with an HR leader about how they're building a high performance culture in their company. Today, we speak with David Hanrahan, the Chief Human Resources Officer at Eventbrite. David tells us about the cultural evolution that they're going through at Eventbrite, their approach to compensation and performance, and what it means to be a great CHRO. Enjoy the show. Okay, David, welcome to the uh, the People Over Perks podcast. Thanks, uh, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. And uh, and so you've held key positions in a, in a whole range of interesting companies: uh, Electronic Arts, Twitter, Zendesk, and, uh, and now Eventbrite as well. Um, I'd love for you to kick off by uh, by painting a picture of your career history to date and uh, and how you ended up where you are. Yeah. Um, gosh. Well. You know, when I was a student, I was really interested in psychology. I was interested in abnormal psychology, biopsychology. I was really just fascinated with the human mind. And um, uh, later in my um, sort of uh, school um, tenure, I came across a class called industrial psychology. <clears throat> and it was, you know, psychology of the workplace, uh, which I found really interesting. I'm like, I wonder, I wonder how they apply these concepts actually in the workplace. And I had a professor say, well, there's there's these graduate programs and something called HR, and I'd never heard of HR before. And coincidentally, a lot of them in the U.S. are in the Midwest, where um, the automotive industry, you know, and manufacturing really flourished, you know, 100 plus years ago. Um, but then all sorts of, um, you know, sort of labor and management conflicts arose. Um, the National Labor Relations Act um, sprang from those. And um, these, these management programs, these MBA programs, these master's programs, were trying to give um, leaders, um, you know, sort of the, the tools to actually more progressively uh, manage workforces. And so that I went to a school in the Midwest um, and originally wanted to get into more of the labor setting. So I started um, my HR career after school in a big um, oil uh, manufacturing company <clears throat> and in, in actually a manufacturing setting where we were doing like contract negotiations and collective bargaining. And so that's a very different world than where I am now. I, I slowly gravitated towards um, uh, more sort of creative um, sort of high growth, faster moving industries, which is, you know, tech. And so I've really spent the better part of my career um, in tech HR leadership roles, um, electronic arts, so I love video games, uh, Twitter, so I was fascinated with social media and Twitter's, you know, rise and kind of was there during the IPO and then gravitated to um, Eventbrite. And I've always been a fan of Eventbrite. Um, and you might notice these companies are, are companies whose product you can actually get your hand around. And I've always been fascinated by Eventbrite. I loved um, live events and, um, you know, Julia Hart's the CEO has been a really progressive CEO. Was one of the very first CEOs to come out with a generous and equal parental leave um, policy in the United States, where that's been, you know, a big issue. <clears throat> it's actually being debated in, in our uh, Congress um, as we speak. And so that's uh, brought me here, Eventbrite, where I've been for about the past two years. Excellent, thanks. And, uh, and so you, you just touched on it there that uh, Eventbrite is, Obviously, you were given by the name an event platform. But for those who might not be quite so familiar, can you give a, a quick introduction to what the company is? Sure. So we are um, an events ticketing platform, and so uh, consumers um, can download the app and find live events in their area, um, searchable by you know the types of things that you like to do: live music, comedy, you know, conferences, education, workshops. Uh, creators, um, so people who want to um, build a business, um, build an events business, um, host a music festival can um, create uh, live events uh, and ticket them um, and market them on the platform. And so we've got um, just countless events all over the globe. And um, so during the pandemic, uh, live events obviously very disrupted. Um, you know, the, the rise of online events, virtual events has also flourished on our platform. Uh, and now we're seeing uh, live events actually start to come back where there's been really good vaccine adoption and um, restrictions are starting to loosen. But so that's us when we're trying to bring the world back together through live experiences, which is a pretty cool uh, mission to be part of. Excellent. And, uh, and and what stage is the business at? How how many employees are you there now? Well, we are um, just hit our three year post IPO anniversary. So we're um, we're still kind of a, you know, a team, you know, relatively in, in a company maturity sense. We still have a lot of our growth potential ahead of us. We are um, just about 700 employees now. Uh, we'll probably continue to grow, hire another, you know, 150 plus people in the next 12 months. So we're in growth mode, um, but we're still early. Um, you know, it's kind of, you know, still kind of a scrappy startup for the most part. Great. And, uh, and, and your role, Chief Human Resources Officer, how would you describe that in a nutshell? Well, I'm trying to um, partner with the leadership team and partner with the rest of the, the company 
to um, adopt progressive practices that help us attract, motivate, and retain the diverse talent that we need in order to win, in order to accomplish that mission. So that's all, all HR and recruiting, but it's also trying to hold the mirror up to our culture. You know, and I don't, I don't think of the CHRO role as authoring culture. I don't think of my job is to say, here's what the culture is. And, but I think of my job is to hold the mirror up and help the, the company understand like when we're at our best, what does that mean? And then bend practices to, to 10 X that, to make sure that we can actually um, achieve that, that cultural dream in terms of our values. Understood. And, uh, and when we were chatting beforehand, you, uh, you, you touched on the fact that you feel that Eventbrite is kind of going through a, a bit of a cultural evolution uh, at the moment. Um, maybe you could tell the audience a bit more about that and uh, you know, what you're trying to achieve with that. Great question. Well, so um, there's been a lot that has changed at the company. And um, I mean, I would say if you, if you go back 10 plus years, way before our IPO, um, the company um, had pretty major ambitions. And whenever you're a small uh, sort of relatively scrappy startup, you get enamored with shiny objects. You chase a lot of things. And so it's hard to focus. And, and so, um, you know, something that we, we struggled with years ago was a lack of focus. We, we said we wanted to do this, but then we want to do this as well. And um, that was a, a cultural struggle. Um, when the pandemic happened, we had this galvanizing moment around like, we need to focus so we can emerge from this stronger. We actually had to reset the business model. So we had a lot of changes in the company structurally. We had a big major reorganization, um, but also in the business model sense, we had to focus on a self-serve approach as opposed to trying to account manage every creator to, to help them execute on their events. That's not scalable. We have to create a technology that's so easy to use if you're a consumer or a creator that um, the technology itself is how we win. And so that in a sense is becoming more of a true tech company. Before the pandemic, only 30% of our company was in a tech role, engineering a product, and we're gonna end this year probably closer to 50%. So, so that's part of one of the, the cultural evolution um, pinned to the business evolution. Um, another part of it, like a lot of companies right now are going through a shift to hybrid working. So that's part of our cultural evolution, like a lot of companies. Um, we were 97% in office before the pandemic. And, you know, we've, we've really adopted a flexible approach, you know, um, whenever, whenever the pandemic subsides, it's your choice, whether you want to work in an office or not. That is a, a cultural evolution that a lot of companies are going to struggle with. We, it's going to be a struggle for us as well. The idea of choice really presiding over, you know, kind of when and how you work, I think is the, is the future of work, as opposed to, you know, the nine to five, 40 hour work week, which is really, you know, came from the Ford Motor Plant, like the 1920s. That's something that's going to have to change. I think for a lot of companies, particularly tech companies, it's not going to change for Ford Motor where you saw the manufacturing sense, but it's going to change for tech companies. You don't have to work that way in a software engineering sense. But back to your question, if you think about where we're at right now, this moment in time, back to that focus, the focus piece, um, we are trying to become a company that is both compassionate at our core, but high performing. So if you look back to the policies that we've, we've adopted and you look back to sort of interviews that, you know, that our leaders have given over the past you know, years, I think hopefully you would see is like, that's a company that's really compassionate. Julia Hartz is, is a compassionate CEO and that, that, is in our, that is in our bones. But a compassionate company has to also be high performing. When you're a public company and you have shareholders and you, know, you, have, you have stock and like, you have to perform, you have to execute. We have a three-year strategy now. We have a focused strategy in the business we have to have a focused culture as well. At our, at our core and our bones will remain compassionate, but I think the really interesting challenge is build muscles of high performance and learning around those bones. And so like we, like we evolved the business um, during the pandemic, we've also evolved the, the culture and the values. So now we've just a couple of weeks ago unveiled five new values that are going to really govern the culture of the company um, they came from the employees themselves. They came from a lot of, you know, focus groups that we've had internally, conversations with the leaders themselves. And I could talk about these, but these new values are kind of, you know, they're, they're those muscles. They're really about high performing and learning around the bone of, of compassion. That's super interesting. And so um, do you have a, a kind of an internal definition of what high performance means? Um, you know, is it really adherence to these company values that you've now unveiled or is it uh, something else on top of that? 
Well, high performance is exceeding your expectations, right? It's exceeding your own expectations as an individual. You think you can do something, but you, but like, what if you actually exceeded it? You need people to kind of coach you and almost push you at times. So like, I, I think I, I think I have a certain potential, but maybe others actually think more of me. They say that you can actually perform better than that. You can exceed that potential. I think if we're high performing, we're really unlocking the true potential of the people who come to choose to work for us for however long that is. Maybe it's a few years, maybe it's longer, but high performance is really unlocking the potential of the organization and unlocking your individual potential. And so um, how do you do that? How do we unlock people's potential? Um, you have to be highly motivated. And so this, this is a really interesting psychology and sort of phenomena to really grapple with as a leader. How do we create a really highly motivated workforce? It's not just, you know, like, you know, kind of a, you know, like, hey, work harder, you know, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell you you're not performing and you better perform or else you're out or you're not getting a compensation increase if you don't perform. Like those, those are as kind of like window dressing. I think the really interesting thing is understanding the motivation of your workforce. And, you know, I'll speak for myself. When I'm highly motivated, I'm coming up with new ideas. I'm like not even watching the clock, right? I'm like, I'm on my laptop late at night and kind of still cranking through something because I'm motivated. I really I care about it. I'm motivated. Maybe I'm doing something on the weekend, not because my boss asked me to or because I'm begrudging like, oh, I'm behind in my work. I'm going to like do this thing on the weekend. But you're just, you're cranking through because you've got, you're motivated. You've got great ideas. You're, you're exceeding your expectation. You're unlocking, you're unlocking new potential in yourself and thus new potential in the organization. So that, that I think, back to your question, what is high performance? it's a highly motivated workforce. And then that one that is then unlocking their own potential. Got it. And then how do you, as the, the, the HR function, then really try and support the business to unlock that potential? Um, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, we, we could talk about some of these topics around like performance management as a, as a general theme. Like how do you tactically within the business try and, uh, try and get the best out of everyone throughout the organization? Well, I think there's some table stake stuff, which is which is like not going to sound new or interesting if you're listening to this, which is candor, like actually have a workforce that talks to each other. And so if you're doing performance cycles, which we can talk about, you know, performance cycles and pay cycles, like, hey, you're paid a certain way. Why? You know, I, here's my view of your performance. There is this like lack of candor that exists in organizations that like abstracts that and then leaves people dissatisfied of like, I don't understand my boss is not talking. To me. I don't know why I'm paid the way I am. I don't know. You know, I, I don't know why I haven't been promoted yet. There's a lack of candor that exists there. And so a big part of like a high performance organization is like candor. And so we have a um, leadership development program that we actually created during the pandemic. We call it lead to win. And um, all our managers go through this. A, a big part of that is like, how do we actually have breakthroughs with our staff and, and you know, candid breakthroughs? And that's, you're going to, you know, radical candor. This will be like not a new concept for, for a lot of people. Um, but I think an interesting thing for us in terms of how, how we approach that is start with yourself. Start with who are you and what motivates you as a manager? Um, what is your vulnerability? What are you good at? What are you not good at? And so we start with a sort of like, get to know you as a leader, then get to know your team, right? So it's a little bit of like Mr. Miyagi and, and um, you know, Karate Kid, like, you know, you know Danielson wants to learn karate but he teaches them all these other interesting, weird things about sort of tapping into his own, you know, humanity before we get to the learning karate thing. And so you got to know your team. You got to know what motivates them and what do they care about? And so there's interesting uh, questions that we have. How are you really, really doing? Actually wanting to know what is the psychology of this person who's been, you know, on lockdown for 18 months and is probably struggling with a lot of stuff. Get to know that person as a human uh, so that you can actually have candid conversations. You can have like a frank, like real breakthrough conversation. Um, and where there's exercises that are called motivational pie chart, which one of my former bosses um, uh, coined and shared with me, which I can talk about. But so there's, there's the leader, there's like the kind of core table stakes. How do we actually get better at candid conversations? And then there's, I think for us in the leadership development sense, like actually understanding and knowing your team. And, and so like building an empathy as a way to get to high performance. So empathy and compassion should be at our core. That's our bones. Let's not lose that that actually can be a pathway to high performance. Having a, a, an empathetic organization can be a high performance organization. Understood. And so, um, and so you, you touched there about uh, your, you know, your performance cycles and about how these are table stakes. Maybe you can go into uh, some details around that. What, is, what does the performance cycle look like at Eventbrite and how have you structured that? 
Yeah, so we have um, a couple of concepts. Um, there's one concept is like, there should always be continuous feedback, right? Like there, there should always be, when I have one-on-ones, I'm, I'm getting a little bit of glimmer into how am I doing this week in this moment? Because there was just something that happened. We got to meet them where they're at. Just had a big project finished this week. I don't want to wait six months to my performance review to know like how that go. I should be hearing about those things. And that's in our leadership development program. So continuous feedback. We also have quarterly check-ins, which are kind of light touch to sit down, talk about my goals. What are, what was, what are my goals for the next quarter? What are my goals for the prior quarter? And my boss just gives me some coaching and some feedback on those. Do those feel like the right goals? Do those feel like they're off? A little bit of sort of steering. And then, then we have um, uh, twice a year. Um, so in the uh, winter and in the spring, we have these kind of more performance cycles. And a performance cycle is um, really the whole organization, the leadership team, they get down to start talking together in these calibrations, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with. We get functional calibrations, engineering, product, and we have product managers join the engineering session. We have engineer, engineering leaders join the product session because they work so closely together. And the, the core there is like, I can in, in my own bubble write some feedback for someone and say, hey, here's how I think you're doing, but I need to get out of my bubble at times, at least twice per year to have like really focused conversations with my, with my, my sort of hive mind, my brain trust of fellow leaders to say, I, I think this person's doing really well. I think they're ready for promotion. And then someone says, whoa, aren't, aren't you aware of how big a mishap they had on this project? And like, they've totally, you know, sort of checked out and what's going on there. And so you have to have those those calibrations, some regular degree, and we do those um, twice per year, and they're really helpful. They're helpful in reducing bias. Um, you know, you can do um, also look at bias um, in promotion processes and see are we promoting or not promoting um, demographics, you know, at unequal rates. And so, anyways, back to your question, you know, I think that's probably something that a lot of organizations are familiar with what I'm describing. Our whole thing is do that and then do it consistently, get better. The next time, get better at it, get better at it, learn, do postmortems. How did it go? Because the whole, the core is like, I don't really want to get super clever with the organization and kind of like throw like, oh, we don't even do performance reviews. Like, you know, like we're going to get really clever with this. Don't out, don't try and outsmart the organization with, with a really clever approach. Have something that is like predictable and understandable. Oh yeah, that's, that's simple. That's straightforward because the muscle building is less of like, building or reworking or redoing the cycle each time the muscle building is just getting better at it better each time we're having more candid conversations we're getting better at this it's it's feeling more crisp the organization is less surprised by their feedback and so that's the core concept for me i, I love that approach to consistently iterating and consistently getting better with every cycle um i think that's uh you know, super valuable to see for everyone in the organization to see that growth mindset being applied to the organization as a whole so that they can then also apply it to themselves. Um, I, I really love that principle. Um, and, uh, and, and then the, the next topic that I'd love to touch on is, um, you know, you, uh, you were mentioning there about the calibrations around, you know, is this person ready for promotion um, and having those discussions? Um, and how do you approach that whole promotion and compensation philosophy at Eventbrite, and how is that tied to performance? So our compensation philosophy is similar to our performance is like, not, not trying to get super clever with this. Um, you, we, you should be paid relative to the market. You should be paid, like I should feel like I'm paid fairly. And by, by fair, I just mean we pay, you know, what you should expect in the market. For some roles that are hard to fill, we pay a little bit above market. Um, but at the core of our compensation is we have cash and equity and, and a, a rich benefits program. And so we're not trying to compete with Google to like pay more than Google. You know, we're not trying to like say, hey, we, we can one up Google in order to land the talent that we need. We're trying to pay relative to the market in the markets that we're at. And we're in the US, we're in Argentina, we're in Spain, Ireland, United Kingdom and Australia. Primarily, those are our major markets for talent. And so we understand what the, what the market is for certain roles, how they pay, they might pay differently in Argentina than they do in the US, and which is definitely true. And we try and understand the market and then we try and structure competitive packages that, you know, or that are rough, roughly at the midpoint or, or above, depending upon the role. Um, and then the really core is like getting better, getting more transparent with that. Because I think what a lot of startups struggle with is the black box of compensation. So someone, you know, has a Google sheet and determines the price for certain roles. And then the leaders know that. 
But the mid-level managers don't know that. The people who actually, I have to hire this person. Can you explain to me why I should, why I'm paying this way? I see this, I see the salary for the person, but I should understand this stuff. What a lot of organizations don't do or they struggle with is like laying out the books. Like, hey, here's the books. Here's, here's what we're seeing. Do you agree with that, you know, manager or leader? We want the leaders to own the compensation, not the, not the BX team. If I'm owning it, if I'm telling you, you got to pay a certain way, you're not going to own it as a leader. And they'll say, hey, sorry, the BX team says you, you, you can only get this. And so, you know, blame them. And then the leaders disown it. And then there's this distrust in compensation. So um, I think for us, a really, you know, a concept that's important is education. So educating managers so that they can own it and talk to their employees about it. Um, and then as best as possible, getting more and more transparent. We're not there yet on transparency, but you know, my, my dream is that everyone sees the range for their roles and they understand, understand like why I'm, okay, I'm, at, I'm at the middle of the range or I'm, I'm actually a little bit below the range because I was just promoted into this role um, and I haven't learned all the skills yet. And I understand that. And you know, um, when organizations are not doing that, there's a ton of distrust. And despite how well you're paying, you might be paying great, but because the organization doesn't know it, there's all this distrust and there's this dissatisfaction that shows up in your surveys or on round compensation. And you're, you're perplexed. Like, why are we, why are, why is there so much distrust? We're, we're, we're spending a lot of money on compensation. It's usually that issue of, of transparency and education. Yeah, that's, that's great. I, I love that. Uh, that thought around putting the ownership on, uh, on the, the managers as well. Um, so that they, they feel fully involved in that process. Um, I think that's uh yeah, a really, uh, really interesting thought there that many, many people can take away from this this conversation. One, one topic, uh, obviously coming off the back of the pandemic, um, that you know all organisations have had to deal with is employee mental health. Um, what, what programs do you have in place at Eventbrite to support employees with uh, with these sorts of areas? So this is a subject I'm really passionate about. I've, I've spoken about quite a bit. Um, you know. There is a mental health crisis um, happening um, in society, um, certainly in the US and I think globally. Um, before the pandemic, um, incidents of mental, um, mental health, uh, anxiety and depression um, were skyrocketing, um, particularly amongst certain um, demographics, millennials and uh, young people. Um, just one very alarming stat, uh, suicide rates for college graduates are 3X today, that which they were of the 50s. So suicide rates 3x versus um, college graduates of the 50s, and um, so it was already a pan, uh, a, you know a, a, an epidemic, and then the pandemic happened, um, and then we've seen anxiety and depression cases skyrocket in the pandemic. Um, caregivers, you know, having um, you know a serious mental health um, strain put on them, uh, as one example. And so we, we saw this and we were already thinking about it before the pandemic. And just one example, um, we had staff on site at an event called the Gilroy Garlic Festival in 2019, where there was a mass shooting. And the, the mental health crisis was really like, we shone a spotlight on it for us. It, gal it was a galvanizing moment back in 2019, where we said, we need to start thinking about this like really seriously. We adopted um, a platform, you know, then, then and there uh, to put mental health on demand in the fingertips of our employees. Our, our platform is called Modern Health. There's others like it. Um, why is that important? Because we saw, you know, at least in the U.S., um, such a difficulty in getting mental health support in our in our healthcare system in the U.S. Only one in ten psychologists were accepting new patients at the time. So it's incredibly difficult to work with your carrier to get mental health. And so people are bounced around. So getting that on demand, I can get a therapist within 24 hours, my company is going to pay for it was a really core part for us. But you have to think more holistically. So during the pandemic, I think what we try to do is think more holistically about mental health. It's not just about a platform or one one solution. And we have to also have to talk about it. So we have to acknowledge the strain that people are under from a leader's perspective. People want to hear their leaders acknowledge how hard this is and the strain and ask and talk to their staff. So vulnerability. Um, I've had conversations, I've, I've had fireside chats, you know, about struggling with my own mental health, you know, during all of this. And, and as a parent, you know, with two kids and like, you know, I've talked about this and I think people need to hear leaders open up and be vulnerable and then prioritize forums. So we've had leaders, um, a leader at our company called, whose name is Nick, he's an engineering leader. He's had um, uh, uh, what we call bright camps, which is basically a, like a lunch and learn on managing burnout, managing and recognizing burnout. What are the tactics that you that we each do? And what we found is people want to talk. They want to actually talk to each other and share, hey, here's, here's the strain. I've been really struggling with this. Parents suddenly realize, oh, you're a parent too. You're struggling. Now we can kind of get together. We can talk. We can form a group. And um, so for us, I think that sort of the, the conversations um, have been really important. 
and um, you know, um, also thinking about um, what other re- what other resources do people need. We're going to um, start to develop um, and un- uh, un- unveil some some new resources for our employees um, that are beyond just uh, mental health um, caregiving caregiving resources flexibility managers um, in- indicating to their staff you should take time off for yourself. Um, what time do you need to manage through this caregiving situation? We have a program called Take the Time You Need. And then during a pandemic, we also launched something called um, Bright Breaks, which is we recognize that we need to sort of break up the week. People are in more meetings per week during the pandemic. Um, they're in like two and a half times more meetings per Microsoft report from the spring. The workday is longer. So we need to break this up. How do we do it? We piloted something called Bright Breaks, which was the first Friday off each month. We'll all take it off. And that was like universally popular, did great things for people's mental health. And so now we have um, as a program now, the first Friday every, uh, every month, the whole company takes off and, some, and to recharge and reset people, you know, go swimming in the North Sea or they like reconnect with their family, go to the park, you know, just, just to break it up has been hugely helpful. Well, I think, um, yeah, thanks for, sh- thanks for sharing all those. I think, that, you know, obviously it's a hugely important topic and it's so, so awesome to see companies like Eventbrite leading the way with, uh, with implementing some of these programs. So Thanks for sharing those tips. And uh, I'd love to shift gears slightly to, uh, to talk a little bit about um, your HR team. Um, maybe you can walk through the, the structure of your team. Um, you know, how, uh, how, how have you built that up over time and, and what does that look like? Sure. So um, my structure is I've got a head of talent acquisition um, and just joined the team, actually. Her name is Maisha and she's fantastic. Um, she's got a PhD in engineering and uh, has been, you know, just a phenomenal um, uh, engineer, a human, but has, has more recently in her career gotten into recruiting. So I've got a head of recruiting. I've got a head of total rewards. So it's all compensation benefits. I've got a head of, of people systems. I've got a, a head of talent management, which is kind of learning and leadership development and growth, um, the performance and engagement cycles. Um, and then I've got a, a head of the HR business partners unit. Um, and, and so those are kind of, those are for me, like the really the core functions and, um, you know, what, like in, in this role, you tend to hear a lot about hiring, like we need to hire, we need to hire more, we need to hire faster, we need to hire differently, we employment brand, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you hear a lot about compensation, you know, and like, we need to pay differently, we need to pay more, or we need to pay, you know, um, adopt this new program. And, um, and then the, you know, you have systems that have to back that up. You have leaders who need to enable that stuff and grow and actually own how to hire really well and how to pay really well. Um, and then you have the face of HR, which is the business partners who tend to get all the questions and they tend to be the, the person who is like manager turns to. So you have to have really good business partners. And so having someone really good at the top of each of those is really core. I've learned that. I've learned, you know, like in painful lessons of, you know, just not getting it sooner, a really good person in each of those roles. Um, and then, you know, you've got to have really good people um, in the recruiting team, in the business partner team that are the front line for the managers or the front line for candidates, you know, who are experiencing the company, mm-hmm. you know, from all these policies that you're creating. Yeah, very cool. And, uh, and obviously, um, uh, you know, with the, with the team that reports into you, how would you describe, you know, the way that you want to be perceived as a leader? What are you trying to, to do to, uh, to, you know, be the, the best possible leader you can for your team? I'm a horrible leader. Uh, no, just kidding. Um, no, I, I, you know, like I, um, I joke, but like, I, I you know, I, I kind of approach my job as like, I can always be better. Like I'm, I'm never satisfied, um, as, as a leader, um, you know, I have a lot of anxiety about, am I doing everything right? Am I serving everyone really well? You learn over time that you can't really serve everyone really well. You have to make choices, strategies about choices. What are we going to do? What we're not going to do? But also leadership is about choices. Um, there are things that I'm going to not prioritize right now because it will take a lot of time and it's going to take me away from this other thing that's more important. Mm-hmm. But for my, for my team, my direct reports, I try to be a servant leader. So I try to be like, um, you know, kind of, what do you need? <laughs> what, what, what feedback do you need? What tools do you need? What resources do you need? What's in your way? How do I remove that for you? Um, and so I try to be a servant leader which is my job is to make them really good as opposed to my job is to tell them what to do. My job is to like, you know, push them and like, you know, kind of like, gosh, you know, work harder. My job is to, you know, enable them and unlock their potential. So I try and be a servant leader. 
Um, there are pros and cons to that approach. Um, you know, a con could be that sometimes I need to be more assertive. Sometimes I might need to push more, you know, and I might need to be very didactic and say, you need to do X, Y, Z. Why hasn't it been done yet? And um, so, you know, there are cons to servant leadership, but in, in, I, I think the pros outweigh the cons and that's what I, I try and be. Excellent. Yeah, I, uh, I love that approach. And, um, and aside from servant leadership, do you, um, do you think there's any uh, particularly big differences between a good CHRO versus a, a great CHRO? So I think a great CHRO has to balance three things. It's a little bit of a Venn diagram. They have to balance strategy, relationships, and operations, or some people call it execution. So strategy, relationship, and, and execution. Sometimes you have a CHRO who's really good at the relationships, right? They're like, they're a people person. That's why like, there's a, there's a meme of like HR people are the people people, you know, like they like people. I got into this cause I like people and I'm, I'm a talker and I'm, you know, I'm fun to talk with. And like, I love my business partner cause they're just so fun, you know, whatever their relationships. Um, and a relationship is trust, respect, and communication. So that in itself is hard to master. You have to master relationships. You have to master strategy. And that's about, you know, we have to go in a certain direction. We have to change the culture of the company. We have to prioritize an approach that is going to help us compete with Google, but not, you know, like make us pay more than Google. And then execution is then delivering on that. You can come up with a strategy, but are you going to execute on it? Sometimes you have CHROs who are good at one thing. They're the executor. They're like, like, and just like, boom, boom, boom. Like we're knocking stuff out, but the strategy is coming from someplace else. Or, you know, they're the relationship pe person, but they can't execute. Or they're the strategy person, but no one likes working with them or they can't execute, you know? And so a good CHRO has to balance each of those and particularly know when you shift. I might be coming into an organization right now where I can't talk strategy because all they care about is the HR function cannot execute. I don't want to hear your ideas, David. I just want to, I just want to see you fix this and execute. Um, or they need to pivot into relationships because there's distrust. There's distrust between the HR organization and the business. So I need to really work on the relationships. I need to go out there and talk to people and understand what's broken. What do you need? What, how, like, what, how can we help? How can we fix this? And so it's good CHRO has to have all three of those, but, but balance also like when I'm, when I'm kind of shifting a little bit more execution focus, when I'm shifting more towards strategy or relationships, but those are the three things I think that can make a really great CHRO. Awesome. And so when, in addition to those uh, th those three components there that make a, a good CHRO, um, do you do you see the role of HR as a function shifting at all? And like, are there any particular developments that you're uh, you're really excited about in in terms of the direction that it's heading? I do think it's shifting. And if you think back to the history of the the, the name of the department, um, you can see this kind of this shift in the name. Uh, it used to be called the personnel department. Um, and then it was human resources and um, human resources it's in my title, but it's like, it's kind of antiquated. Like a human is a resource. It's kind of like, you know, like thinking of it sort of like Taylorism type of thing. Um, and that's kind of did where it came from. It kind of came from Taylorism. Uh, and then suddenly there's the people team, you know, and like, Hey, it's, it's really about people. And now, now it's like experience, right? Employee experience. I think Salesforce's um, HR team is called the employee experience team and our, we call it Brightling experience. And so what, what is behind that shift? I think it's like what's behind the shift is, is trying to get more and more progressive, trying to move away from, you know, the Ford motor plant in the 1920s and how management thought of people and, and um, the relationship between uh, leadership and, and labor. Um, and more thinking about like, our job is to unlock the human potential of this organization. We should be thinking about it as people inherently want to do good. They inherently want to perform. And it is, there's, we put things in the, in the way of people. We organizationally put things in their way that prevent uh, people from performing. That's a flipping of the view uh, of performance of an organization. I think it's a flipping of view of the role as well. How do we unlock human potential? And part of that is getting much more um, scientific, um, looking at data, understanding um, human psychology, just one example, we don't know right now what is motivating our team, but what it, what's motivating people is fascinating and it's complex and we have to better understand that. We have to have systems that enable that. And increasingly, we have to have systems and data that are more real time. You know, the idea of doing a survey once a year or the idea of, I'm just going to look at your compensation once per year, that's kind of antiquated. And I think we're going to shift into 
knowing more real time, you know, enabling data and systems and practices that are more geared towards unlocking human potential um, and, and building trust and looking at employees as inherently wanting to do good, as opposed to looking at employees as like, they're trying to game us. We got to find ways to, to push them more. Yeah, absolutely. And in, in addition to that data piece, um, are there any other uh, particularly thorny HR problems that you wish you could kind of click your fingers and, and solve? Um, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I think the idea of human connection in hybrid workplaces um, being uh, heavily disrupted and not having really great solutions for it. I'm just give you an example. Um, I was on a call with a bunch of CHROs the other day um, with uh, someone from the government who was asking, who was thinking, like worried about mental health and, um, and thinking about workplaces. Workplaces can actually fuel the, the rebound of mental health. That was this person's um, thesis in the government. And who's asking, what are you doing right now to kind of foster human connection, to sort of alleviate the pain of the pandemic? And some people were talking about like, um, you know, we're, we're trying to have Zoom happy hours and like that sort of stuff. I, I'm like, I'm, I'm definitely not trying to do Zoom happy hours. People do not want to be on one more Zoom meeting. We want to find ways to connect them in their community to actually have less meetings because there's two and a half times more meetings in the pandemic. We need to have less meetings and more impactful meetings. And particularly at your question, in this future, we're heading towards hybrid work. We have a lot of remote working and, and people not going into offices as much anymore. How do you create human connection amongst coworkers in that? It's not really a Zoom happy hour. How do you do that? Uh, there are going to be startups that try and solve this, that try and do, you know, interesting, like little weird things that sort of connect people on Slack or whatever. Um, but I don't think we've cracked that problem yet. How do we actually create human connection, um, you know, in this new setting that we're moving towards? I wish I, wish I could sound my fingers and crack that one. Yeah, that's a that's a really a really really great one to solve, and uh, yeah, I think um, obviously many companies across the globe are also trying to uh, trying to crack that one. And uh, and so just just one final question to to wrap up from my side: um, Do you have any particular resources or books or courses or recommendations for our audience um, that uh, they might want to check out that would then uh, you know help them progress in their own career uh, in uh, in, the, in the coming months? I do, um, and I should say that um, I, I got this from a colleague um, named John John Foster, who's also himself a CHRO. Um, and we were um, wondering, um, like, what is what's a really good sort of progressive book out there that's kind of shaping uh, some new practices um, in teams and companies? And the book is called Prime to Perform, and um, it is uh, it's a book out. You can you can get the download of it. Um, so Prime to Perform uh, is a book, um, it's a management book, um, and I'm not really a big management book fan, um, but I, I've, I found in reading this um, with each chapter, a new way of looking at everything from compensation, performance management, to leadership development. And so that's one I would, I would recommend. I also got to recommend if you're not into books, but you're just more into Twitter, um, my colleague Lars Schmidt, um, who um, runs a, a, a consulting uh, practice, um, uh, he's got fascinating Twitter feed and is, is always retweeting really and interviewing really prominent CHROs who are really progressive and, and uh, bite-sized, uh, you know, sort of content, which is great. Yes, absolutely. And I saw he uh, he, he published um, a whole bunch of open source guides recently as well. So uh, we'll yeah. uh, be sure to, uh, to link to those as well in the show notes. Definitely. Um, David, this has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much. And, uh, and I know you. that we, uh, everyone listening will hopefully have uh, some, uh, some great takeaways. And so uh, thank you again for your time and, uh, and lovely to chat. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks for listening to this episode of People Over Perks by Leapsum. We're available on the Leapsum YouTube channel and all major podcasting platforms so you can hit subscribe to receive each episode as it's released. We also have an email newsletter and a Slack community where you'll find great resources and discussions on how to build a high-performing, humane and diverse company culture. You can find the link in the show notes or you can head to the resources section at leapsum.com. Thanks for joining us and see you next time.